Good morning, everyone. I want to go ahead and begin our webinar this morning. Um, let me first uh, start by saying good morning again and welcome. Thank you uh, for joining us this morning um, and for your interest in the 2022 James Irvine Foundation Leadership Awards. Um, um, my name, for those who don't know me, is Cindy Downing. I'm a program officer at the Irvine Foundation. I work out of our SF office. Um, Irvine has two offices, the other one being in LA. Um, we're excited to host this informational webinar. The, it's the um, first time that I've been able to, to host one of these. And I'm really excited to offer this uh, opportunity to everyone today to help you submit a competitive nomination for the 2022 awards. Um, we'll, we hope to, um, uh, to help you by providing an overview first of the Leadership Awards program. Um, our team, and then the selection criteria and the process. Um, and we'll also uh, save time at the end for your questions um, and as, uh, share some tips for nominating a leader. Um, so a little bit about the foundation in case you um, are unfamiliar with us. Uh, we are, we the James Irvine Foundation, our uh, private nonprofit grant making institution dedicated to expanding opportunity for the people of California and um, we have been doing so since our founding in 1937, so quite a while. <laughs> um, in recent years, though, the foundation began to narrow our focus um, of our grant making. And um, following that, we restructured our internal operations and directed our strategic grant making in order to achieve um, what is now our one sing our, our singular goal, um, and that is uh, California where all low income workers have the power to advance economically. So we have approximately 3 billion in assets. Um, and last year, or, or I'm sorry, in 2020, Irvine made um, 109 million in grants uh, to organizations uh, for the benefit of the people of California. And um, let's see. And so, you know, just um, to speak a bit more about our narrow focus, is um, while I'm very excited about Irvine's work to uh, work and focus on economic mobility for California's low income workers, um, I'm also especially proud that the, the, the leadership awards continue. Um, the program plays an even more important role to me by lifting up the critical work and in innovative models of leaders, regardless of their issue area, population, sector, or, or region served. Um, the program helps to helps Irvine to learn about effective work taking place throughout California and work that's outside of our core grant making and but still impacts the well being of low income Californians and is still very important to a thriving state. Um, and uh, the program also provides uh, Irvine a way to support the work and of these leaders um, and their organizations that may may not and would likely not. Uh, be able to fit or uh, be eligible for funding through our other programs and our other um, three or four newly launched initiatives. So um, I'm very excited um, to have this opportunity uh, to continue to highlight the good work of, of leaders in California. Um, the, the, about the program specifically, the awards was established in 2006. Um, each year we recognize individuals or pairs and organizations that are confronting the state's critical challenges with innovative and effective solutions that improve people's lives and contribute to a better California. Uh, the foundation spotlights exemplary leaders and helps to share their approaches and with policymakers and peers um, and, and we provide each of the organizations um, of the leaders a grant of 250,000, um, as well as additional uh, resources and supports. Uh, and since its um, establishment in 2006, uh, we have recognized 100 diverse um, and innovative California leaders through the program. Um, this year, after years of, um, sorry, after years of them supporting aspects of the program, the foundation has decided to elevate the partnership with Capital Impacts, which is a Sacramento based consulting firm um, and have them begin to manage fully the program, the leadership boards program. Um, and with that, Irvine will continue to 
fully fund and support the, the awards, um, but are super grateful to Capital Impact, um, whom you'll meet shortly, um, and in, in their expanded role uh, in, in their um, efforts to take the program to the next level. Um, and so, again, thank you all for being here. Um, I'd like to turn it over and introduce uh, my colleague and um, uh, someone you should definitely know if you want to be a part of the program or be involved with the Leaders Rewards program, that's Melissa Granville. She is the Senior Program Director at Capital Impact. She oversees um, the day-to-day -day operations of the program um, and so much more. <laughs> and she will now walk through the selection criteria process and the process. Um, and uh, um, thank you again. Off to you. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Capital Impact is honored to support the Leadership Awards program. Um, I, I actually, uh, in my previous role, nominated a leader for the awards. Um, and while they were not selected, uh, I did learn a lot about the process um, from the nominator's perspective. And now as a staff member, I'm really excited to help support uh, you, uh, nominators, uh, navigate the process. So I'm going to jump right in uh, and start talking about the selection committee and the selection timeline. Um, and uh, just wanted to say that if you have any questions, uh, please submit them through the Q&A tool. Uh, I mean, we will address them all in the last 20 to 30 minutes of the session. Hopefully we can get through the material and, and really prioritize uh, the questions that you have. So um, each year, uh, an independent selection committee of California leaders identifies four to six uh, recipients of the James Irvine Foundation Leadership Awards. These leaders are distinguished uh, for their extensive contributions to California communities and institutions. They work in diverse fields uh, and reflect the ethnic and regional diversity of California. So what is the process for selecting these leaders? Um, next slide, please. As you know, uh, nominations are now open for the 2022 awards. Uh, and the process really starts uh, when lovely folks uh, like you submit nominations that reflect the diversity of California's populations and regions. So after the deadline on May 7th, um, staff will review and advance nominations that are the most aligned with the awards criteria. We will get into those awards criteria a little bit later. Uh, in July, the selection committee will select 10 to 12 finalists um, who are then notified. Uh, between August and October, staff and consultants and an expert in the fields or in the finalist field uh, will meet with the finalists individually to better understand their work and its impact on California. In August, all nominators will be notified about the status of their nomination. So if you were to nominate someone, you would find out in August um, where you're at in the process. The selection committee will meet again in late October um, to select the four to six award recipients after which uh, we shortly notify all finalists and recipients about that decision. The four to six finalists uh, will then be announced in February 2022 at a reception in Sacramento. Um, the foundation spotlights these leaders and helps share their approaches with policymakers and peers through one-on-one -on -one meetings with policymakers and a floor ceremony. So who is eligible for the nominee, uh, to be nominated for a leadership award? Um, next slide, please. Next slide. So nominated leaders must be residents of California. They can be uh, an individual, as Cindy mentioned, they can be an individual or a pair of leaders, uh, and they can work in any sector or field. As Cindy mentioned earlier, this is there is no preference uh, among issue area sectors or regions. Next slide, please. So the awards uh, recognize notable leadership characterized by six criteria, uh, significance, effectiveness, innovation, inclusiveness, timing, and leadership capacity. For significance, uh, the, leader, the leader's work should address an issue that is critical to California, and the issue is anticipated to affect the quality of life of substan substantial number of Californians in the future. For innovation, uh, the leader is advancing an innovative strategy that directly improves people's lives. 
We've expanded this definition slightly and I'll, I'll address that later. Um, the work should represent an entirely new approach, is not widely known or practiced, or applies a proven approach uh, in a new way or within a new context. For effectiveness, uh, the leader should uh, be highly effective in achieving, achieving positive change. And uh, the selection committee really uh, loves to see a measurable, measurable record of accomplishment. For inclusiveness, uh, the leader helps bridge uh, build bridges among people with differing viewpoints or different backgrounds, and the leader uh, brings diverse experiences to their work and creates opportunity for underserved communities. Timing, uh, the leader's project is at a stage conducive to replication or informing policy, and there's an urgency or uh, opportunity for the nominee to expand their work. Lastly, uh, but not least, uh, is leadership capacity. So the leader is well positioned and prepared to uh, take the next step in advancing change. We will dive into these uh, selection criteria a bit more to discuss the nuances and um, recommendations or tips we might have for nominators. Next slide, please. So uh, the t here, here are the 2020 uh, Leadership Award recipients, and uh, I just wanted to show them as an example of a cohort of leaders that um, demonstrate alignment with the awards criteria. So uh, these award recipients are advancing solutions that are critical um, to or that are critical on, on several um, issues facing Californians: career readiness, civic engagement. Uh, parole process reform, uh, environmental justice, financial access for youth and youth development. Next slide. So what's new this year? So we've made some slight changes, the foundation has made some slight changes to um, the process and nominations form. Uh, we've adjusted some word counts, so please keep this in mind as you're uh, crafting your uh, nomination. We've also uh, made some slight tweaks to um, the innovation to expand, um, to include an entirely new approach um, that is not widely known or practiced or uh, applies a proven approach in a new way or within a new context. Um, we've also updated the timing. Um, as you all know, uh, the pandemic has impacted many leaders work and we wanna honor that. Um, so the uh, with that in mind, uh, the most competitive nominations will describe leaders advancing multi-year projects with a track record of effectiveness that are also timely and innovative. Um, and perhaps that includes as a result of the, the pandemic. Uh, nominators are also encouraged to describe how nominees have adapted their work or developed new innovations to address the pandemic uh, and related challenges um, if applicable. With that, uh, I would like to pass the baton to Catherine Hazelton, uh, who has worked on the Leadership Awards program for a, a quite a long time, um, and will walk through some tips and nuances for submitting a competitive nomination. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Hazelton. I've been working with the Irvine Leadership Awards program since 2009, including as a nominations reviewer. As Melissa noted, uh, staff when, uh, when we receive the, the nominations, take an initial first pass at reviewing the nominations before sending them on to the selection committee. Uh, we send along the nominations that demonstrate uh, close alignment with the selection criteria and the selection committee take it from there. Today, I'm gonna to share some tips from the perspective of a nomination reviewer, as well as tips from the guidelines that the selection committee uses when they are reviewing nominations. So we score each nomination based on how closely it aligns with the selection criteria. This means that it's important to use the prompts and address the criteria and the specific questions that are asked in the nominations form. I'm gonna start by talking about a few of those questions and criteria. So let's start with the summary section. The summary is where nominators describe the work of the leader and the leader's organization. Is there a specific model or a specific approach that the nominee has developed or is advancing? If so, we recommend discussing that specific approach here and throughout the nomination. 
And you'll note that several of the criteria inquire about an issue that the leader's addressing or about their approach. And you may have gleaned that this award is as much about the work of the leader and the organization as it is about the leader themselves. So while it is a leadership award, it's about both the leader and their work. Let's move on to the significance section. And this is where nominators describe the problem that the leader and the organization are working to solve and why it's important to California. It's helpful to describe the population or the community that's affected by the problem. We recommend indicating the number of people who are affected now or projected to be affected in the future. And I saw an early question come through already um, asking about how many people uh, rises to the level of significance. And there's no hard and fast number, but I would say if there were, uh, if there were an approach that, uh, that was reaching a very, very small uh, portion of the population, let's say you know, a, a thousand Californians and didn't likely have the ability to be scaled up to reach other Californians, that wouldn't necessarily be considered significant. It's, um, it's more about reaching a uh, relatively large population of California. But what's interesting is if it is a smaller population, um, it, it could be that the, that the effect for that particular population is so strong and so important, perhaps it's a life or death issue for a smaller population, then that would, uh, would achieve significance. So let's move into types of innovation. We consider many forms of innovation as Melissa noted, um, and this could mean the, the classical definition of innovation where we're talking about an entirely new approach, a creative leap from standard practices. The leader has created something new. That's certainly considered innovation. The awards program also thinks about innovation in a couple of different ways. For instance, we might think about uh, an approach that is not widely known or practiced in California, but it could be practiced by one or more particular communities. Perhaps it's a traditional approach practiced in a community uh, that is not necessarily well known outside of that community. And the leader may have some desire to, uh, to inform a larger set of Californians about that approach. Innovation could also mean a leader is applying a proven approach in a new way or within a new context. Uh, so for instance, let's say there's a model that has worked very well in the city of Los Angeles and it's known and proven to work well in Los Angeles, but it hasn't really been tested or tested effectively in a rural setting. And the leader has taken that city model and, and applied it in a rural setting that could be considered innovative. Another example might be a model that originally was tested in education. Maybe it was tested in K-12 schools and that model is now being taken and, and used in a corrections setting. So the innovation there is, is that the model is used within a new context. A question that we ask ourselves as reviewers is whether the leader's work might serve as an informative model for other communities. Could it influence how others approach a problem? And that's what we consider innovation. Let's move on to effectiveness. So in the effectiveness section, we're looking for how the leader has achieved positive change or directly improved people's lives. Has the leader made substantial progress in addressing the problem? More competitive nominations will provide tangible, measurable evidence of effectiveness, such as data from evaluations, from case studies, or other types of assessments. Some nominators also provide examples or anecdotes about how the work directly impacts their life or other people's lives. We recommend that you describe how effective the leader has been at addressing the problem described in the significant section. So not the nominee's overall effectiveness as a leader or a person. Uh, changes within the organization like the budget or staff level, uh, that's less aligned with the criteria uh, and the selection committee looks more at evidence of the leader's effectiveness at advancing their specific model and achieving the type of change they're, they're seeking to achieve. So uh, we just talked about a few of the different selection criteria. I'm also just going to pause there on the specific criteria and note that when we're evaluating and when the selection committee is evaluating nominations, they try to step back and consider each nomination holistically. So reviewers tend to ask ourselves three sets of questions. Let's explore each of those. 
First, we look at the holistic question of, is there opportunity that the leader may have to leverage a leadership award? So let's, let's think about how they might leverage it. Would receiving an award create new opportunities for this leader to expand their work or to inform policy? Is the timing right? Is there likely to be relevant, is it likely to be relevant in the current and, and future political context? Is the work ready to be replicated? And is the leader ready to take this work to the next level? So for instance, if a, a leader were just about to retire, uh, we would not be thinking of, of them being as competitive and ready to take the work to the next level. Would the recognition or the resources from this award make a difference? Or is the leader's organization perhaps so large and the leader already so well known that the award wouldn't really matter? Those are a few different ways that we look at leverage and whether, um, whether the leader would have the opportunity to really uh, leverage the supports that come along with a leadership award. As we look at the awards holistically, we also think about unique qualities of nominations. So does the nominee have an interesting story to tell? Do policymakers and peers in the leader's field know this story? Do they know the leader or this approach? Or would there be something new for them to learn by recognizing this leader? We also think about whether the awards program itself has recently recognized someone doing very similar work. So if you look back at, let's say, that cohort from 2020 that Melissa showed earlier, and you see a leader in that cohort who is doing something very, very similar to the person you're thinking about nominating, I would suggest waiting a couple of years um, to, to nominate that person or thinking about someone else you might want to nominate. Um, as we're looking holistically at the pool, another uh, key issue is diversity. The selection committee is very careful to think about whether each particular nomination diversifies the nomination pool, the finalist pool, the set of leaders that they might be advancing. So we consider a number of different factors as we think about diversity. We think about the issues on which the leaders work. We think about their sector, public sector, private sector, nonprofit. We think about the region in which they work. Uh, of course, we look at the leader's ethnic background and any life experiences that they might bring to their work. So I'm going to address one other question that we hear really frequently from nominators, and that is who should prepare and submit a nomination? Really, the answer is anyone can nominate. Uh, some think that they need to get a very prominent person to submit a nomination, uh, like a policymaker. And well, this is interesting and it might be considered. There are a lot of types of nominators who can describe and validate a nominee's work and provide context for why it's important. It doesn't just need to be a, a prominent person. Um, so the most important factor is that the nominator is well acquainted with the nominee and they can describe the nominee's alignment with the award criteria. Some nominators know the nominee's policy field very well, so they can describe how the nominee's approach is different from their peers. Or they might be able to identify where there's opportunity for expansion and replication because they understand the field. So this might be a policymaker, could be a funder, could be a researcher, or maybe a board member. Other nominators can describe how they personally or community members have been affected by the nominee's work. So this could be a client or another community leader who has observed the nominee in action. It's required that the nominator be someone other than the nominee or a family member and preferably not employed by the nominee. I'm gonna stop here for now and turn the conversation back over to Melissa so she can open and invite questions. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Catherine. So um, we have a couple of questions that are already queued up, um, but if you have heard anything so far that uh, sparked any questions, feel free to add them in the Q&A and we'll address them live. So I'll read them out uh, and then uh, we will respond to them. So um, our first question is, uh, can there be multiple nominations submitted uh, for the same leader? Um, and Catherine, I, I uh, welcome your uh, kind of thoughts on this. 
So we recommend that um, that a, a leader have only one nomination in the pool, uh, because ultimately, when the nominations go to the selection committee, uh, we are are most likely to only advance one nomination. And we might not choose the right one. Uh, so we recommend um, that a nominator have only one nomination. Um, if two nominators want to nominate the same person, they can submit a joint nomination. Um, we, we would recommend that approach. Now, obviously, uh, nominators aren't always involved in their nominations or nominees aren't always involved in their nominations and they may not be aware that multiple people are or and the nominators might not be aware that multiple people are nominating the same person. So no one, of, of course, is disqualified because they've received multiple nominations, um, but we may select only one of those nominations to advance to the selection committee. Thank you. Okay. Um... Another question we have is how can we describe the population affected by our work uh, if the issue we can work or the issue we work on affects all Californians? Do you want to also take this one, Catherine? Um, sure. So I, I think it's fair to say it affects all Californians. Um, there may also be um, be cases in which uh, one can state. Um, particular Californians that may be affected. So let's say the issue is about air quality and obviously all Californians breathe air and, and would be affected by air quality. There might be particular Californians that are um, more affected either because of health conditions or because of regions in which they live uh, where they, they suffer um, greater air quality uh, problems. So uh, it's okay to say that everyone would be affected, but if there are ways that you can highlight or elevate particular populations that, um, that might have an even greater impact, uh, we would welcome that. Great, thank you. So uh, the next question is, if the leader's issue area, e.g. homelessness, was awarded in 2019, but the model and population are different, would you still recommend waiting? Um, so I'll, I'll take this question, but uh, Cindy and Catherine, feel free to chime in. Um, so uh, homelessness is a very timely issue for the state of California. And so we, you know, if you have a strong nomination in that arena, I would not necessarily wait. Um, and I think just making sure that you, um, uh, you know, pay attention to the criteria and, um, you know, uh, move forward with your, with your nomination. Um, I think there have been many times when we, uh, or when the selection committee selects the same issue area in, in, a, in several years. Um, so is there anything that I missed, Cindy or Catherine there? I think you got that just right. Um, it's obviously a critical issue and, um, and it, we just would not want to necessarily be elevating a model that is very, very similar to how it was recently, um, to another model that was recently um, elevated by the awards, but, um, but certainly would welcome nominations related to homelessness or other issues that have been recognized in the last couple of years. And I think, um, I also appreciate that question in that um, it reminds me that it's um, helpful that when beginning to think through your nomination um, or think through whom you might want to nominate to uh, visit the website and look at who's been recently recognized and what work they've done um, to really make sure that your nomination and your leader uh, stands apart in some way you know, and, and that your nomination speaks to that directly. Um, will be really important in having it be uh, most competitive. Thank you. Uh, this question I'm actually going to have Cindy field. Um, so are there specific criteria for how the award awarded funds can be used? Thank you. Um, so good question. Um, I think while we very much have um, <clears throat> designed in the program with the intention of um, the most flexibility as possible for the leaders to use the funds um, uh, because of their strong leadership, they should be able to make the decision on how to best use those funds um, in ways that maybe other funding is restricted um, and giving them that, that opportunity to 
uh, that can be very rare and and, and, um, and and with that, the only restrictions that we have um, are those that are uh, passed down from the, our trust. So from the um, establishment of the foundation um, and within, the, within our trust, there's uh, restrictions around grant making, um, our grant funds being used um, only within, for, only for services within California. Um, and then also uh, uh, the, it, in relation to um, government support, um, we are unable to fund organizations that receive more than 50% of their funding from uh, government sources, not government grants, but government sources. Um, and the way that we are able to continue to support leaders uh, who do uh, work in organizations with with that who meet that criteria of, um, of the, over the threshold of fifty percent is um, then we ask that they identify a project that they're working on that does not receive um, over fifty percent of government funding, um, and then we fund that project specifically. Um, so for those organizations, unfortunately, there uh, we don't have the opportunity to to give full flexibility for a general operating. Uh, we do have to ask that they provide um, a, a, a project for us to fund and then lay out um, you know, specific to that project um, in accordance with our, with our trust restrictions. Um, and um, I, I believe that's one of the things that stands out the most in my mind. I'll have to check um, uh, to see if there's anything else, but um, uh, those are the two that are, 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 are definitely important. Um, and also, it, um, it goes without saying that funding goes to the leaders organization so we don't fund individuals um and we have to and in, with pairs we'd have to um the, the the two the pairs would have to decide which organization would be would, would receive the grant funds so that would be between a decision for the for that team to to make um and then we would just follow their direction thank you cindy Okay, so I have a couple of questions um, about the nominate tour. Um, so uh, I think two questions are, are uh, I understand the nominator should not be employed by the nominee, um, but could the nominator be someone higher or equal rank as the leader in the same organization? Um, and a si similar question is the, can it be the CEO or CPO? Um, uh, Catherine, could, would you mind clarifying? Sure, absolutely. So I don't think the issue there, I don't think the issue there so much is um, about whether the nominator um, is, is, let's say, under in the, um, in the structure of the organization is, is necessarily working under the, um, the nominee. It's more about whether the nominator can provide some context about the nominee's work. So they have that context because they work in the field as well, because perhaps they're a leader in the field, because perhaps they have a, a bird's eye view of the field uh, for, some, for some reason. Perhaps they are an unusual ally, someone that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be standing up for this leader. So it's, um, it is helpful for the selection committee to understand the context of the leader's work when the nominator is outside of their organization and can provide some of that context. Uh, if there have been uh, leadership award recipients who have been nominated by members of their staff um, and it's not something that is prohibited, it's just not recommended because the selection committee likes to see that context of a nominator who is outside of the nominee's organization. Thank you. Uh, kind of in a similar um, vein, uh, the can a pair of nominees be from the same organization? So for example, could it be the executive director and a program officer? Um, I, uh, the answer is yes, uh, they can be. Any nuances there that you wanna provide, uh, Cindy or Catherine? Uh, 
I would add that um, that not only can they both be part of the same organization, and often they are, um, but there can be other configurations. So perhaps there is um, a leader who originated the organization or originated the approach and now serves on the board and in an emeritus uh, role with the organization. And they're paired with the leader who is currently perhaps the executive director and implementing the model um, that the, the founder had created. Um, we've seen those types of pairings in the past. Um, we've also seen where clients who are highly involved, clients who become staff um, are highly involved in the model and they're paired with perhaps the executive director. So there are all sorts of configurations that work there as well as leaders from two different organizations. Thank you. So, um... Uh, we've mentioned that uh, that the nominees should be a California resident. Uh, one of the questions we got is, can a, can you nominate a leader whose organization holds the 501c3 in another state? Um, the leadership and work uh, they are doing is in California or for California residents, but it just happens to be um, held in another state. Uh, so Catherine, do you want to field this? Actually, I'll defer to Cindy on that. Okay. Seems like the California, uh, the leader is a California resident as well. Yeah, um, so I appreciate that. And um, I like that folks are really getting into it because <laughs> um, it, it can get very complicated. Um, it is um, the work of, of us grant makers to kind of work through these, these uh, un unpack a lot of this, um, this this web, but um, so uh, we do we do give grants supporting um, national nonprofits, um, but we offer project support uh, grants that are structured to fund specifically the services that are conducted uh, in California, and so the leader would be in California. the The project that would be identified would be. Uh, focus and um, and to the benefit of, of California, um, but it's okay if uh, the organization is, is headquartered or um, you know they have other presence nationally. That that's fine. Um, but you know I think keeping in mind uh, because we are a California funder uh, that the the leader, um, I think you know you want to highlight the person the, the nominee's um, leadership within California. Uh, so that's really in, important to. to to focus in on that, and so when you're talking when you're talking about launching um, programs or impact, um, please uh, be specific to to the impact and to the work done within the state, um, and less so about nationally. Um, though that work is, of course, very appreciated and it's important. Um, it's not going to strengthen your nomination here. Thank you, Cindy. I'm going to I'm going to keep you on the spot. Um, so one of the questions we got was, do you provide feedback on submitted nominations after the event? So, you know, in August, when we email all the nominators, um, do they get feedback at that point or after um, February once we announce the, nom the nomination or uh, the four to six award recipients? Um, unfortunately, we don't have the ability to give feedback to each of the uh, to each nominator. Um, you know, we're open to receiving um, feedback from, from folks in their experience and things that may have been challenging so that we can improve the following year um, to be to provide more clarity, to provide more opportunities, um, such as this right now. I think this is a, a really great example of um, us adapting the program to get ahead of some of the questions that come up for, nom for nominees, or no, I'm sorry, for nominators um, in the process. So, you know, we're really striving to get ahead of that, um, but uh, we would really be unable to give specific individualized feedback to folks uh, on, their, um, on their submissions. Thank you, Cindy. So um, the next question is, if someone has been announced as a leader previously, are they unlikely to be chosen again? Uh, Catherine, do you wanna field this question? Sure. Uh, the Leadership Boards program has recognized the same leader twice. And I think 
um, they would the program would be very unlikely to do so. I would not recommend nominating someone who has previously been nominated. Similarly, we don't recommend nominating leaders from the same organization. Um, we did provide a little clarity on that in the uh, FAQ in recent years that um, if a leader worked for a very, very large organization, let's say the University of California, and there were, and even get more specific, let's say we're looking at, at um, at UC Santa Barbara, and um, and there are two different leaders working in completely different departments, working on completely different issues. Um, then the selection committee would would be open to um, to considering a leader from an organization um, that the selection committee has already recognized. Um, and in fact, UC San Francisco is a good example of this. Um, it has had a couple of different uh, leadership award recipients. Um, but outside of the very large organization where leaders are not working with each other, not collaborating, doing, doing work that's very distinct from one another, um, it would be unlikely that the awards would recognize the same leader twice or recognize two leaders from the same organization. Thank you. I'm going to build off of that to answer the next question, which is we submitted a successful nomination last year on behalf of the field partner, but are considering applying for one of our uh, internal leaders this year. Uh, does that past successful nomination reduce our chances this year? Um, and the short answer is no. Um, we have, you know, you could nominate, uh, you can continue nominating folks, uh, it, the, the same apply for, or the, the same kind of lens for nominate uh, for leaders does not apply to nominate tours. Um. Okay. Another question we have is, um, can uh, the communities assisted by undocumented or mixed lawful, uh, can the communities be uh, undocumented or mixed lawful status? Uh, yes, of course. Um, we've we've um, the selection committee has recognized several leaders in the past that have worked with undocumented or mixed lawful status populations. Okay. We have a couple of questions, uh, Cindy, related to uh, the funds, how the funds can be used. Um, I'll, I'll kind of answer or ask both both of these questions. Is there a cap on indirect costs? charged by a university, um, does the same rule apply if the organization receives 50% or more of funding through state contracts? Um, thanks. So let me, um, sorry, let me just um, look at those again. So um, as far as the uh, state contract, of it's, um, if, it's um, my understanding is if the relationship with the, the state is a fee for service as you are a contractor and they're a customer, um, that that is um, that should be fine. I believe that's exempt. It's a different kind of um, relationship as opposed to um, over 50 percent of, of grant funding um, or, you know, um, um, different kinds of public entities grant funding, that's where uh, we get into, um, you know, some, some tricky waters in um, being in alignment with our trust. Um, so, I mean, I, I struggle with the question because I think, you know, we're able to kind of learn a bit more about the structure of the organization's finances to see what specifically that means as far as um, being contracted by the state in what way. Um, and if that does constitute um, or uh, build, do that constitute to the 50% or if it doesn't? And so it's, it's a kind of challenging um, question to answer generally, um, but I can give some reassurance that, um, you know, regardless of the organization's relationship and, and, and funding, um, if they, if, if you, I think it's, um, any of the winners or any of the recipients in the past um, who had funding from the government um, and had, you know, some uh, hesitance or, or um, we've been able to work that through. Uh, we've been able to work that out with them and and find, find a way so they can still receive funding, find a way so that they can still uh, get support. Um, and so 
you know, I uh, wanted to just reassure that once we're able to look at things more uh, individualized, um, we can answer that this, this question um, more directly. Um, but um, at the face of it, it's that it shouldn't it shouldn't count to the fifty percent. Um, and the second question, I'm sorry, uh, was around um, uh, feedback. I'm sorry. Well, um, Oh, the indirect costs charged by the university. Uh, so we do not have um, a cap to our indirect, uh, to what to the percentage that our grantees list as for indirect uh, costs. Um, we really um, are really mindful of trying to provide the true costs um, to our grantees for the projects they're um, operating. And um, we understand that oftentimes they don't have um, any influence on the rate that their, their university partners or their, their university um, requires for indirect. And so um, the, the, there is not a cap. Um, okay, thank you, Cindy. So the next question we have is how many nominations are submitted? Um, so in previous years, we've received hundreds of nominations um, and, uh, you know, I think we plan to or imagine that we would uh, still receive hundreds of nominations this year, um, or we would expect to. Uh, next question is, uh, in the application, does the nominator get to share their context to the leader uh, and their knowledge of the field? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are many areas in which you could do this as a nominator. Uh, one is the leadership capacity especially um, understand, using your kind of ex expertise in the field and your understanding of the leader and uh, crafting a response in that section that um, can provide your, your perspective. Catherine, Cindy, do you have anything else to add there? Yeah, I would just build on that. I am there. Well, we don't ask a specific question about what the nominator's context is in the role. Um, it's something that you can weave into a number of different questions. Another one that stands out for me is in the timing of recognition section, um, where that's opportunity where you can really talk about what what the field is open to at this point. So it might be what policymakers are interested in right now. It might be what their peers in the field are, are interested in. And if that's context that you have, perhaps because you also work in that field, um, that's a great place to talk about it. Innovation is another place um, where you can lend uh, your, uh, your context where you can say, look, no one else in our field does this, or you know, others in our field do it this way, this leader does it this other way. Um, I would not recommend that a nominator spend a lot of time talking about themselves and their own work, um, but they can reference back to it as and, and rely on it and say, you know, I, I can validate this work. I definitely um, agree and just wanted to um, put in an additional, um, just uh, put in an additional thought of being um, mindful of the word count as far as choosing what to highlight and what to focus in, focus on in your responses. Um, if it's critical that, or if it really, really um, drives the point home to discuss, to, to talk about your, how you relate to the nominee um, and to do some context setting, um, how, that, that's fine, that's great. Um, but just keep in mind that um, there is a, a limited word count and you'll want to make the most of, um, of your response. Thank you. Next question we have is, and we have about nine minutes, so I think we'll probably take a couple of more questions and then we'll um, wrap up. Uh, so the last, or one question is, uh, can you provide an example of a successful application and are the most competitive applications project-based? Um, so I'll respond to the first part um, and then uh, Catherine would love to have you field the second question. Um, we uh, won't provide a, an example of a successful application, however, we would suggest that you review the um, all of the award recipients that have, you know, the people who have received the award to understand just um, how they have defined or discussed their innovation, effectiveness, et cetera. Um, Catherine? Sure. Um, as to the question of whether successful nominations um, should be project based, I would say it's really important to have a balance of both the project and the leader. So um, we, the selection committee wants to see 
the, um, the specific approach or model or project that the leader and their organization is advancing, but they also want to get a sense of what the leader's role in that is. Did the leader originate the model? Did the leader, um, uh, you know, help to replicate and scale the model? Um, is the leader bringing their own lived experiences to improving the model? Uh, so they want to see, the section committee wants to see evidence of both a strong project and a, a leader who is uh, uniquely advancing that work. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next question is, uh, is a group of board members of a nonprofit considered strong nominators? Um, Catherine, do you wanna feel that also? I think the nomination form might only allow for two nominators. Might um, send that back to you, Melissa. So if a group means two, um, <laughs> I think um, that is something to consider. Uh, I, I, you know, I really hesitate to say who specifically is a strong nominator because the it, it's just so broad. Um, you know, we have had had um, one nomination that always stands out for me is a, a young client of a nominator who wrote a very compelling nomination um, that didn't at all sound like someone who worked in development um, might have, <laughs> have written a nomination or a grant proposal, but they were really speaking from their own context. We've had plenty of board members also write about, um, about their understanding in a very compelling way. So, um, uh, so they might be a great set of nominators um, and others might be too. Thank you. The next question we have is, should the proposed funding be addressed in the application? Uh, I'll field this, but I would love uh, Cindy to chime in if, if I um, am missing anything. Um, so we do, or the selection committee is very interested in understanding how the, uh, the leader might leverage the supports, um, both the, the financial supports, but also the, um, you know, kind of policymaker and um, scaling types of supports that we uh, provide uh, after receiving the award. Um, so not necessarily, um, you know, specifics on how you would spend the money necessarily, but more of just how you would leverage the award or the, how the nominator or the nominee might leverage the award. Does that, did that capture everything? Catherine, Cindy, anything to add? Yeah, that's great. Um, I think it, it helps also with the timeliness as far as um, uh, how the funding and the work that's funded um, the, the 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 work or the project that might be funded through the awards um, grant uh, helps to uh, build a momentum or helps the leader in a certain um, in a certain moment in how they have uh, in their work in their progression in, um, in their career. I think that it's also a, a place where you could talk about how um, they see the awards as fitting in a kind of a trajectory for the leader. Thank you. So two more questions um, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so one of the questions is you mentioned part of winning the award means the leader will share their work with policymakers. What does that look like? So um, uh, as a part of uh, receiving the award, um, we will pr provide tailored supports to each leader. Um, and I, I will put it a little asterisk uh, and say that the award recipients in the past have been varied in their expertise uh, in influencing policymakers. And so part of that is working very directly with the leaders and their teams to craft messaging, to um, establish the right relationships um, to help them accomplish their goals and help them scale in whatever way makes sense. Um, and we say policymakers, uh, that's both at the state and local level. And so it's really the supports that uh, the leader receives are really tailored to the needs and desires of the, um, the leader themselves. Um, so it, it looks, it kind of looks very different for, for every person. Okay. Last question, and then um, we'll wrap up. Um, can funds awarded be used towards capital campaigns on a specific project? Cindy, do you want to field that? Um, I believe so. I don't. As long as um, I'm pretty sure that as um, that it's a if it's a project 
I'm trying to think about other different um, restrictions. I believe that shouldn't be a problem. Um, I don't know that there's so many different ways that our recipients have used their funds. And um, it feels like there must be a case where um, we've contributed to, at least in part, a capital campaign. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't think, I don't believe that our, our trust restrictions has um, any influence on, on that particular um, use. Um, as long, you know, it's already mentioned in the question that it would be a, a project-based um, grant, and so there would be some structure around it. Um, the, but um, there is no uh, restriction around funding a capital campaign. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, with that, I'd like to wrap up and thank everyone for joining us here today. Um, we are going to hit you with a poll here, which is actually our survey. We'd love to hear from you about um, about this event. Was it helpful for you? Um, you know, are you are you likely to nominate a leader now? Um, and uh, so, if you might wouldn't mind taking a few minutes just to fill out this poll here um, that have, has popped up on your screen, and uh, you know, we will send out an email here in the next um, day or so with uh, some resources um, and to help you, uh, you know, get started on your nomination. Um, we hope we hope you decide to nominate someone, and uh, we look forward to to reading them. So we'll give a few more minutes here for folks to fill out their polls. Well, um, thanks again for joining us and uh, we'll go ahead and end the session. Um, have a, a great rest of your day. We look forward to reviewing your nominations. Thank you everyone.